Hi everyone, thanks for joining today's webinar on carbon footprinting for SMEs. We're going to be hearing today from two of our Carbon Trust experts, um, Sarah Laidler and Imogen Catterall. Um, you'll also have the opportunity to ask any questions you might have. Um, you can type these into the questions pane on the right hand side of the control panel. Feel free to send these in at any time and we'll go through them at the end during the Q&A session. We'll also be sending out the slides um, after today's webinar and it will be available to watch in full on YouTube as well. All right, I will now hand you over to Sarah Laidler and Imogen Catterall. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this Carbon Trust webinar. Today we'll be focusing on an introduction to carbon footprinting for SMEs. This webinar is provided through the Green Business Fund as one of the range of webinars we'll be delivering targeting at SME organisations. In today's webinar, my colleague Imogen and I will walk you through what carbon footprinting is, why it's useful, and how your organisation can measure a carbon footprint. But first, it's good to give a bit of background and I'll introduce the Carbon Trust. The Carbon Trust is a non-for-profit organisation whose mission it is to accelerate the move to a low carbon economy. We work with a range of organisations to develop tools and strategies across the globe to, carbon, to combat climate change. Our experience was with SMEs, governments and both organisations within the public and private sector. Within this slide, there's just a few of the clients that we have worked with over the years and some brands you might already recognise. So hopefully most of you will understand what climate change is and how it's a problem for both governments and businesses. But to set the scene, we can discuss some background and information around the problem. This graph shows the total anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions from 2000 to 2010 were the, high, were the highest in human history. To accompany this, since 1998, we have seen some of the highest temperatures across the globe over a century period. To address this, to address this, organisations have begun working together. The 2015 Paris Agreement allowed for a platform for governments to pledge to keep the global warming temperature below two degrees to minimise irreversible environmental damage. Although governments have taken a stand on this, it still falls on the businesses to contribute to lower their carbon footprint also. Since then, many businesses have developed science-based targets, which is a joint initiative between the CDP, the UN Global Compact, and the World Resources Institute and WWF as well. What this means in simplest terms, a science-based target is a target for organisations to meet to keep global warming below two degrees. Over 525 organisations so far have made science-based commitments and some have begun to introduce carbon pricing and electrification of their company fleet. Before all this, however, companies have begun to measure and monitor their carbon footprint as a benchmark. I will now hand over to Imogen to explain the ins and outs of what carbon footprint actually is. Okay, so a carbon footprint is the total greenhouse gas emissions caused directly and indirectly by an individual organisation, event or product. And this is expressed as a carbon dioxide equivalent, so CO2E. So the main greenhouse gases are carbon dioxide, methane and nitrous oxide. So carbon dioxide arises from the burning of fossil fuels, such as coal, oil or gas. Methane is from cattle and other mammals who chew on cud. Methane is also produced from decomposing organic waste, manure, leaking natural gas, land transformation and rice production. Nitrous oxide arises from agriculture through fertilisers and crops. So alongside this, there are also a much longer list of gases contributing to carbon footprints, such as refrigerants, including HFCs, PFCs and SF6. So refrigerants can be liable to leak and should be checked regularly. Um, these are all combined to calculate a carbon dioxide equivalent value using the global warming potentials, which account for the different impacts of these gases. So the carbon emissions equivalent is the volume of activity, for example, on how much electricity or gas is used. Um, the volume is then multiplied by the emission factor, which can be found through phase. And so we'll touch on this a little bit later. Um, to calculate an organisation's total carbon footprint, you can then sum all of the carbon dioxide equivalents, for example, the carbon dioxide equivalent used by electricity, gas and refrigerants. 
So measuring your carbon footprint will mainly consist of scope one and two emissions, but business travel should also be considered when, which is in scope three emissions. So this includes um, private cars and airplanes. Um, the scopes are split out by the greenhouse gas protocol, which is widely used standard that sets out how to account for your GHG emissions. It categorizes emissions into three groups or scopes. So scope one consists of direct emissions that result from activities within your organizational control. This might include on-site fuel usage, gases, um, manufacturing and process emissions, refrigerant losses and company owned vehicles. Scope two are the indirect emissions upstream from the organization from any electricity, heat or steam you purchase and use. Scope two emissions are emissions that you're not directly um, accountable that are not direct. Um, for example, when you use scope one emissions such as gas, you can see it being used in front of you. Whereas electricity, it has already been created by a power company, but because you are using it, the power you have to account, um, that power you have to account for those emissions. This means you are indirectly responsible for the release of CO2. Then scope three includes all other indirect emissions from sources outside of your direct control. Scope three emissions include all upstream and downstream emissions not, including in, not included in scope two. For example, purchase goods and services, use of sold products, employee commuting and business travel, outsource transportation, waste disposal and water consumption. Um, finally, to calculate your carbon footprint, it would be recommended to include scope one and two emissions, which are highlighted uh, on the slide. Um, things such as fugitive emissions relate to any emissions that are associated to air conditioning where you use refrigerants. Later in the presentation, we'll run through examples of how to calculate emissions from scope one and two, um, which could be gas or electricity consumption. Both your scope one and two emissions lie within your own operations, whereas scope three emissions will extend further upstream and downstream of your value chain. What we mean by looking at upstream is the emissions of your suppliers, so everything that happens before your operations take over. Um, that can include production, transportation, manufacturing, process, and everything that you need to get into your, your operations. Um, looking at downstream, that could be if perhaps your organization makes a product, what is the emissions associated with that product downstream? It can include distribution, processing, the actual use of it, and also the end of life treatment as well. But as a starting point, most organizations will begin with their own operations and then look to explore the whole value chain. So why is it important to calculate your carbon footprint? So there are a number of reasons why it's important step for organizations to take. So an organizational carbon footprint can tell you where the main sources of consumption are and also show you how committed an organization is to reducing them. Um, so it's important to calculate your carbon footprint as it helps manage greenhouse gas emissions. For example, through calculating your emissions, an organization can quantify the impact on climate change, identify, prioritize, and reduce emissions, and through identifying hotspot consumption areas, this can often result in cost savings. For example, old inefficient lighting can often be very energy intensive. Through upgrading the lights, organizations can often see payback periods within two to five years. Through calculating your footprint, this allows organizations to accurately report their carbon footprint. This is regulatory for quoted companies to report in their annual report since 2013. And DEFRA estimates this will help save 4 million tonnes of CO2 by 2021. Reporting your organisational carbon footprint can also be beneficial on a voluntary basis to help set science-based targets, encourage corporate social responsibility programmes and respond to customers and investors and report to CDP. And just to add an Imogen's point there, a lot of organisations are now asking their suppliers, whether they're big or small, for carbon footprint data as they can help provide real insight into their supply chain emissions. So even if you haven't considered your supply chain emissions already, having a carbon footprint calculated can help quantify one of your client's scope three emissions. They'll take your actual scope one and two data and put that into their own calculations rather than using um, an industry or a sector average. And then finally, understanding your organization's carbon footprint can help encourage employee engagement and incorporate carbon reduction initiatives. So there are three types of carbon footprints organizations can measure. Organizational footprints, supply chain footprints, and value chain and product footprints. Sorry. Um, so organizational footprints are the emissions from all activities across the organization. 
This includes buildings, energy use, industrial processes, and company vehicles. Supplier and value chain footprints are the emissions associated with delivering all of a particular business's products and services from the extraction of raw materials and manufacturing right through, through to its use and final re reuse, recycling or disposal. And then product footprints include the emissions over the whole life of a product or service from the extraction of raw materials and manufacturing right through to its use and final reuse. Um, so today we're going to run through organisational footprints and product carbon footprints. So when calculating your organisational carbon footprint, the first two steps is to pick a method to be followed, in which the majority use the greenhouse gas protocol. There is another option of um, looking at the ISO 14064, which is accepted, but this is built upon the greenhouse gas protocol as well. The next option, the next step is to choose your boundary. More often than not, this is operational, but it can also be a financial control. Um, I'll spend a little time sort of discussing about the differences here. So an operational control relates to everything your business has direct control over. So if your organization owns a building and then leases that out to a tenant, but the tenant has control of the things such as heating and cooling, you would class that as a financial control because you don't actually have the operational measures to control that for the tenant. Um, operational is when you do control the heating and, and cooling and the electricity usage as well. <clears throat> so to calculate your carbon footprint, you need to collect and collate data relating to scope one and two emissions. This can be through primary data or estimation when available. In the next few slides, we will go through how to understand your primary data and how to calculate consumption based on estimation. The best form of data would be primary data. This can be from invoices from your electricity and gas providers. Primary data directly reflects the amount of resource consumed. For example, the kilowatt hours of electricity consumed at a site or the liters of fuel consumed by the vehicle fleet. This should be collected and provided wherever possible. So this is just an example of primary data from electricity invoice. So the invoice is split into day unit charges and night unit charges, outlining the consumption of meter read for the, for the month of March. So the meter read is highlighted in the red circles. This outlines the current consumption on the meter since installation. The meter read can be compared against the meter in the property to check the consistency. It would be advised to pro provide your energy providers with actual readings taken from your meter to ensure the figures are as accurate in terms of consumption as possible. So the kilowatt hours are highlighted in the green circles. Um, so they're the units used during the month. Um, indicated on the invoice. So for this invoice, there's 2,600 kilowatt hours used during the day and 20 kilowatt hours used, used during the night. So the kilowatt hours can be checked um, by looking at the month's meter read of 26825 and subtracting from the previous month's meter read. So linking this back to the calculation for the tons of CO2 equivalent, this kilowatt hour figure can be multiplied by the emission factor from Bayes and that would be your total, um, your tons of CO2 equivalent for this month for electricity. So if primary data is not available, such as the invoice, estimates would be the second choice. So estimates should be calculated based on proxy data that reflects the actual consumption as closely as possible. For example, the cost of a fuel consumed at a site or the number of miles traveled by a vehicle. So estimates of distance can be made for travel data so the calculations on the slide are examples of how you can calculate taxi, rail, private car, tube and bus distance. So to calculate the distance, expense reports or costs on the travel type would be necessary. For taxis, rail and private car travel, the total cost of the journey can be divided by the cost per kilometre or mile, which is outlined to calculate the distance. For example, private car travel distance would be the total cost of the journey. So for example, 20 pounds um, could be divided by 0 0.45, which would calculate a total distance of 44.4 miles. And then for tube and bus travel, it's a similar process, but there are different, there are specific emission factors associated, such as the ones shown on the slide. So to calculate the distance, it would be the cost of the journey divided by those emissions factors outlined. So another form of secondary data would be to calculate annual kilowatt hours consumed from electricity or gas. So occasionally when invoices cannot be provided, estimations have to be made. 
If the organization has a few months of usage available, the organization can take the kilowatt hours consumed and divide by the number of days that usage covers. So for example, it was, um, if it was over December, this would be 31 days. You would do the usage on the month divided by 31, and then that would be multiplied by the amount, number of days in the year, which is 365, um, which would calculate the annual kilowatt hours consumed. So just to note, this method can mean there'll be a slight overestimation or underestimation of energy consumed. Um, so for example, if you base this on an invoice for December, more energy would typically be consumed during this month due to the coldness and fewer hours of daylight. And therefore your energy consumption um, would be much higher than say in June. Um, so it would always be recommended to collate as there many invoices and track meter rates from your energy providers for the most accurate footprint. So the least preferred method of estimations would be where there is no direct data available. Estimates should be made based on the best available comparison. So for example, using consumption figures from a comparable site or using benchmark figures for energy consumption per meter squared. The next step is to make sure you're using up-to-date emission factors, which are downloadable from the government website of Bayes, and apply this to your activity data for the report and year. Um, it's important that this is updated on an annual basis because um, emission factors such as the one for electricity for the grid, that can decarbonize on an annual basis as we incorporate more renewable energy into the grid mix. The next step is to finally verify the results. So this can be done by either a third party, such as the Carbon Trust, and helps add credibility to your footprint calculation. There's two different options you can take. You can take a total footprint measurement, which could be the logo on the side, which is carbon measured for 2018. Or if you've measured this over a period of time and you're confident with it, you can look to verify your emission reductions. So the Carbon Trust will also recognize organizations who reduce their carbon footprint over a period of three years, which will be a carbon trust reducing logo. Okay, so this is a case study that we've put to get what we've used in this um, webinar, because it's a, it's a great one to use. Um, this is Just Scott's Wine Merchants. They have, for the last five years, published their carbon footprint with the carbon trust. So. The main driver behind this is because they wanted to reduce their carbon footprint per bottle of wine sold. So in doing that, they used an intensity metric. When you're calculating your carbon footprint, you can look at it um, on an absolute term, which is, as Imogen described, all your activity data plus um, times by an emission factor, which will give you the X amount of tons of carbon that your organization produces but you can also look at it on an intensity metric as well. So in the case for Jeff Scotts, they wanted to see what that number would be divided by the amount of wine they've sold that year. In the last four years alone, the carbon emissions per bottle have reduced. Um, they have also have key drivers because they're part of a larger supply chain and a lot of their investors were asking um, what they're doing on their sustainability front. And they also want to attract clients who value corporate social responsibility as well. And also they recognize that having a verification from a third party allows them to offset their emissions with confidence and align their company with a lower environmental damage um, status almost. So organizations can also calculate product carbon footprints as well as organizational footprints. So product carbon footprints are calculated through the total sum of greenhouse gases produced throughout its life, life cycle, either cradle to gate, which is business to business, or cradle to grade, which is business to consumer. Um, a good example of this is Samsung. So they were the first mobile devices to have a certified carbon label. Um, if you've recently bought a Samsung um, and still have a box, you can see our logo on the back as a certified product. Um, product carbon footprint is also very good for organizations who want to single out a product um, from their organization. So in the case of Just Scots, they could have had um, a carbon footprint per bottle of wine, which would be slightly different. Another good example that is maybe more local is the carbon footprint of Allied Bakery's Kingsmill product chain. So they've used um, our product carbon footprint, which is verified as a competitive edge against the other brands. So a carbon footprint of a product or service is an assessment of the greenhouse gas emissions that are released as part of the product's life cycle. So similar, 
Similarly to organizational footprints, a product carbon footprint is measured in carbon dioxide equivalent. So the product's life cycle is defined in five stages. So it starts with the raw material production and extraction and distribution. The next stage includes the emissions associated with the product manufacturing, then goes on to distribution and retail of the product, then into the use phase of the product in consumer uses and emissions associated with this. Finally, the emissions associated with disposal and recycling. So a footprint can incorporate um, part of the life cycle, which is the cradle to gate, um, or the entire life cycle, which is cradle to grave. So cradle to gate footprints are useful for business to business consumers, um, partnerships, um, while cradle to grave foot footprints are relevant for business to consumer products. So the diagram shown outlines the stages associated to whether the product footprint would be based on a boundary of cradle to gate or cradle to grave. So they would be um, the stages included dependent on the boundary that you wanted to associate your product with. So to calculate a product's carbon footprint, there are a number of stages to go through to ensure it is accurate and includes all associated, all associated materials and emissions. So to understand everything associated with the product's life cycle, the first step is to create a process map. A process map can help to visualize the processes associated with each stage of the product's life cycle. This would include all materials, activities, and processes for each stage. The second step would um, be to check the boundaries and determine the priorities, as some emissions can be excluded. For instance, consumer travel to retail outlets to collect the products. Calculating a high-level footprint will help focus data collection on the main greenhouse gas emission sources and eliminate others. The next step is collecting the data. So that would be the same sort of scenario as an organisational carbon footprint. Data such as litres of fuel and consumed per product can be calculated by litres of, litres of fuel used during the production phase divided by the number of products. Data will be all energy used to create the product, distribute it and hold it as well. Of course, this still depends on your boundary and where you cut off, um, whether it's cradle to gate or cradle to grave. The next step is calculating the footprint. So that's done by, again, applying the correct emission factors to come up with the final figure of kilograms or tons of CO2e per product. And finally, the next step is to verify the footprint, which can be done in three ways based on the product as well. So the first is self-verification. Well, whilst it's a simple choice, it does lack reputational value and accredited accredited independent verification. The second is to use another company which provides greater impartiality by ensuring someone who's not involved in the process reviews the footprint assessment. And finally is third party assurance where someone like the Carbon Trust could come in. This option provides the greatest certainty and impartiality in the accuracy of the footprint as the verifier has also been independently certified by the nat national accreditation body. Okay, so communicate, communicating your carbon footprint can be really powerful, um, whether it's a product or an organization. It can help engage employees, customers, and stakeholders into sustainability and efficiency. Jascots, for example, have used this to demonstrate their efforts in reducing their carbon footprint over time and offsetting the remainder as a business. Measuring a carbon footprint and communicating is an important step to improving the sustainability of your organization, and it can help identify areas where more efficiency can be achieved. When you start to calculate a carbon footprint, you'll see which parts are having the biggest impact. And you can look to tackle those separately. Okay, so we're gonna go into what other further resources and support we have available. And um, this slide will cover just some of the key headings that we'll go through all together. Um, as I said at the start, um, this webinar is set up by the Green Business Fund. So we just got a bit of a slide on saying what that is. It's a scheme operated by the Carbon Trust to contribute to improve sustainability and energy efficiency and help serve small to medium-sized businesses in England, Scotland and Wales. The fund today provides a combination of advice and training. There is scope for the fund to expand both in the UK and internationally should additional funding be made available by suitable body for that purpose. Um, other support that we have, um, we have some upcoming workshops, should you be interested. I think these are located in Telford, Birmingham, Swansea and Northampton. What these are, two hour workshops delivered by a carbon trust expert to help you understand more about things such as low energy consumption and identify low 
cost measures to help improve your energy efficiency. Um, next, we also have some opportunity assessments, which Imogen will go through. Um, so these are qualifying to small and medium sized businesses within England, Scotland and Wales. So opportunity assessments will um, help to highlight three top energy saving opportunities for your organisation, which is delivered by a carbon trust engineer. And then there's also implementation advice, which provides support to businesses on procuring energy saving equipment, also provided with up to five day support from a carbon trust consultant. So further resources include the virtual energy manager, which is um, similar to a workshop, but helps to look to embed good practice and realize the identified savings associated with improved energy management. <coughs> um, technical webinars, um, such as this one, to help learn more about energy consuming equipment and how to make savings. And finally, we have a number of publications um, which can be found on our website, such as HVAC, lighting and renewable energy sources. Okay, so we also have some energy saving tools available to use now. So this includes a carbon footprint calculator, which calculates your footprint into scope one and two emissions. Once you've calculated yourself, it's always a useful tool to check, even if you're used for reporting. Um, you can also then benchmark your energy use to see if you're performing within the average of your sector. And additionally, we also have further tools to look at a deep dive on how to build a business case for low low cost energy efficiency measures such as lighting upgrades. So I think we've got time now to just give you a bit of a demonstration on how this works, so it's easy to use. <clears throat> okay, so this will be provided in the slides that we give out today as well. I've put the link in the bottom. So if you just go to start, enter my data. So we just go with company X. 2018 or whatever reporting period you wish to check building x and let's go natural gas so if i just type in 45 in kilowatt hour So we'll do this for natural gas, electricity, and we're going to do it for um, diesel as well. So we'll assume that this fake organization has some fleet. Okay, let's assume that's it. You just go calculate my footprint. And this will break it down into the scope one emissions, which is a direct energy processes, and your scope two emissions, which is indirect, just purely from electricity as well. So you can also do this as a benchmarking tool if you want to take this further. You can just email the results to yourself in terms of if you want to check this. If you want to assess um, where your organization is, you can just type where your organization is. I'm just making this up as I go along. So let's say it's 3,000. And it's annual update results. Okay. So this is an estimated energy profile of the site. So it will give a breakdown on what's spent on lighting, office equipment, and heating. Um, and it also is within the industry standards. So that'll be a great to know as well. Um, you can then take this further in terms of the business case, as we mentioned before, um, and just put in the details which you think are relevant to your business. So if it's five days a week, this is pretty average. Um, if you know your energy spend, let's say you've got no daylight sensors, high bay, and a flash of light. Yeah, and you can find default cost data. Let's see. Um, it's got no... I can't actually see because there's everyone else in the way. <laughs> there we go. There. So you can start looking at building a business case for the investment and saving and average payback period. It also pumps out a rough est estimate on what you could save by upgrading to, your to an LED based system as well. So hopefully that can help you um, wherever you are on your sort of carbon footprint and journey. Those tools are very handy and easy to use um, to go forward. Let me just pop back with the slides. There we are. Okay. 
Okay, and then we also have Start to Act, which is an EU funded program to improve energy efficiency in young SMEs and startups across Europe. So as part of Start to Act, the Carbon Trust is offering two consulting services, which is three on-site visits from a Carbon Trust expert to help you identify low and no cost energy saving opportunities and improve your energy management processes. There's also phone support from a Carbon Trust expert to learn more about how to operate your business within, with energy efficiency in mind. So you can sign up by um, emailing the email address there. And finally, we also have some guides on our website for you to download, which covers in more detail some of the technical aspects. There is one available for carbon footprinting. Should you wish to look any more detail than we've covered in this webinar, that is also available for you to look at. I think that's it in terms of the content for the webinar. We're going to pause um, the webinar now for, for you to ask any questions you might have and then come back in about five minutes and answer these. Okay, we've got some questions that we're going to address now. Um, one of the ones is, is it worth knowing your carbon footprint before making an investment in an initiative such as low energy lighting? I would say yes. Um, it's always good to communicate um, how much LED or transferring your, what your light into something better is going to be. Um, if you look at it um, from what it was before, it's always great to communicate that, that to higher management or put that on a website as well and another question is is the tool on your website and free to users and how can ct help small organizations um, become um, into low emissions so yes the website is um, it's on our website and it is free to users so um, the link should be in the slides that will get sent to everyone and then also to help small organizations the um, activities outlined um, under the green business fund are all free so opportunity assessments all the webinars the publications and um, implementation advice are all free to SMEs so opportunity assessments can help provide SMEs with um, identifying low cost um, carbon initiatives it can also highlight energy saving um, with little to no cost um, and then another question 
uh, about attending the workshops, they are extremely helpful um, if you've not been to one before. So they just sort of go through all of the um, more technical side behind energy savings and um, more information about the Green Business Fund and how we can help your organisation. We also have a question on what is included in your footprint and would rented properties be included in your footprint? If you're renting out to somebody else and it's within your operational control, I'd say yes. Um, but if it's if it's a leased asset, for instance, then that would come under a scope three. So it really does go back to what um, Imogen and I mentioned before in terms of defining that boundary and what you want to include. Um, I would think that would come under um, a scope three calculation. So if you're just looking at scope one and two, um, then no, rented properties would not come into that. But if it's properties that you are renting for yourselves, then that would come into it under a calculation footprint. Um, so another question is, is an external building survey something which the Carbon Trust could advise us on? Um, so yes, so like I said, um, opportunity assessments. So depending on your energy spend, um, we either do remote or on-site visits, which will um, survey the building, let you know what type of opportunities are available. So if it was heating that you think you've got issues with, um, or if it's the building that could be the problem, in terms of insulation that would also be noted so the um, energy consultant who goes to the on-site or does the remote assessment would help you identify that so that is another that is a free service that you can get um, so the email address on the slide is something that you can get in contact with is that something you would be interested in and then the last question is just about whether the web webinar will be available to view later yes this webinar does go onto YouTube and the slides will also be circulated to all attendees. Um, I'll also quickly address one of the questions there in terms of providing gas boilers and a biomass unit to a, as a district heating network. Um, if you don't directly benefit from it yourselves, um, but you still pay for it, then it technically would fall into your scope on emissions. Um, so I would include that in a carbon footprint calculation. And I think, I don't know if we had any other questions to go through. Um, I'll give it a couple more minutes. Ah, okay, so we've got a question saying, how could we calculate refrigerants that if you are in a tenanted building? So this is always a fun one when we calculate a carbon footprint. So if you're in a situation where you're renting office space and you share that with a lot of other organizations and maybe bills, um, refrigerant logs aren't necessarily directly available to you you can request them from a landlord and what will happen there is that it will be proportioned out to you in terms of um, your floor area for instance so if you occupy two floors then you will have two floors worth of that um, consumption whether it's um, refrigerants or electricity as well um, so there's always that way to get around it as well it's always just worth asking that um, asking that question There's another question on if you don't collect business travel information. Um, that's quite common in a lot of organizations we've started to work with. Um, if you don't collect it in terms of miles, um, it's always possible to identify it through expense data as well. And you can work backwards from that in terms of what Imogen talked about before. You can use spend data and calculate back to retrieve miles and then calculate emissions from there. And I think that's it in terms of questions coming through. Um, if you have any other further questions to ask that you don't, didn't want to ask on the webinar, there is that email address that's on the screen at the moment, um, should you want, wish to pick us up further. Um, so yeah, I think that concludes the webinar. Thank you everybody for joining, I hope it was useful. Um, as I just said, these slides will be available and the YouTube recording will be available also. Thank you very much. Thank you everyone.